Welcome to Public Square. Thank you all for joining us here. And Jose, I, I'd like to start with you. Can you talk a little bit about how you found a role model? I got this little side job working landscaping with this man, Gary. He gave me a lot of skills. Um, this man is a great inspiration to me and I know to many others. When he was, when he was born, um, something happened to him that um, he had very, very partial vision and he went to college and he got one of the hardest degrees uh, there is to get and that's in engineering. Um, and he did it all with very, very, very partial vision. So he had overcome all these challenges. Why was that important to see for you? What did that tell you? It told me that uh, it doesn't matter what your challenges are. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter uh, what obstacles life puts in front of you. If you want something, you have to get it. You have to work more than, you, than anybody expects you to work. I knew that it, it didn't matter how much um, obstacles I had in my life. If Mr. Gary could, then I could too. So Leonardo, what was it like for you growing up? Were your parents around? Were they role models or not? The first time when I came here to the United States, uh, it was it was not really that easy for me to get along with my dad because he was gone from me for a good time. You know, it was kind of it was kind of weird being around somebody that I haven't seen for a good, for a while, about almost you know for years. You know, so later on we started like I don't know he he started forgetting what was my likes. You know what I used to do, what I like to play. My dad always, you know, told me, well, I don't really don't know what you want, but all I want you to do is good. And he, th he told me, you know, if you're not going to go to school, because I never went to school, he, he told me, you know what, come work with me. He would teach me. He started teaching me about mechanics, fixing cars. And that was pretty nice, but then our situation was not really much together. It was more like a friend. Uh, we didn't see each other like, mm -hmm. like father son. I ain't going to lie. He used to be rude to my mom, you know. He used to be, oh, he used to be violent with your mom? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was living that situation where I was confused and don't know what to do till I got to that point where I decided to put a stop and, you know, and even push me even more away from my family, you know. So was, So you tried to intervene when he was beating yeah, up your mom? Yeah, and thing happens and, and they kicked me out and I was all, you know, just, what am I going to do? And till I started knowing friends, family, you know, like they used to tell me, come on, man, I'll give you, the he, they gave me that brother love that I never felt from my dad, you know. I started stealing from stores, you know, I started getting to the juvenile, started going, and, you know, when I come out, I thought I was ready to be another person. But it would just keep coming back and keep coming back until one day I went to La Placita. It took you a while, but you found someone. It took me a to while to find someone, and when I met that person, I did the same thing that my mom told me, you know. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm Leonardo. I just came here in peace to look for work. He, he taught me how to be a man. He taught me how to really work together and work for what you really want. He taught me that, you know what, maybe you didn't have your parents, but you have somebody else that will love you and will care for you. He taught me that no matter what in this life, always think for the positive thing. I, I want to turn to Jose. Over here, you you did have your dad for a while, yeah. but then he got deported. So what has that been like for you? I mean, how was he a role model and, and what have you done since then? You know, we lost everything, house, everything. When he got deported? Yeah. And then, uh, well, I had left to Mexico and like took my child away, uh, childhood away, like I ripped my family apart. So, he was a role model because uh, besides like the way we lost everything, he never gave up on life and Mexico's a hard place to live, like and especially in Juarez, like all the violence and it's hard to get a stable job, it's hard to, it's hard. I went to Mexico with him because I didn't want to leave him alone. So he showed me, he, he started showing me what's wrong, what's what's good, what's with the bad and good things. Like, if I would have stood here, I think I would have been in jail, in prison, or de like dead, or I don't know. So he's still in Mexico? Yeah. How do you guys keep in touch? Mm, phone. Mm -hmm. He'll call and 
you know, just talk, you know. Like sometimes I feel alone. Like, but when we talk, it gives me like strength. It gives me like more just to do good. Like, did you find support at La Plazita to sort of fill that that emptiness? Yeah. That he left. Did you find other guys to help you? Yeah. Well, these guys, like Edso, Leo, Jose, my uncle. Mm-hmm. I came back in May mm -hmm. this year. Okay. Sometimes I feel alone because he's not here. Mm -hmm. What's your plans for the future? Become, I don't know, I want to keep going to college, you know, maybe one day try to bring my dad back. Mm -hmm. That's well, that's my big goal right now, so try to fight, you know, like to bring him back. Okay. Um, at Seoul. So when you were growing up, uh, was your dad around? At the young age, I always wanted to be like my dad. Since I always looked up to him. He was, he was big, he was strong, he, I don't know, he just, he was my dad, he was mm -hmm. like my hero, so. And he was, he, was, he was pretty traditional too, so I always looked up to him that way, like in a Lakota way, so I always wanted to learn, learn from him, I always wanted to be like him. Was he around as you got older? Well, he, he was always gone, because like, he, he was in the Navy, so he always had to go like on like wherever he, they sent him to go. So every time he left, he would, he would always tell me, he'd be like, son, he's like, I gotta go, for, go, go away for a little while. He won't tell me how long, he'll be gone. He'll just be like, I'll be back though, he said. Uh, um, he told me, he's like, take care of your mom, take care of your sister, you're the man in the house. So uh, going through that whole stage from like five to about like middle school, I didn't have like really no real models, no men in my life to tell me how to, how to act and how to cheat people and just, just not to teach me things. And traditionally, it's your, it's your dad, he teaches you your traditional knowledge, this and that. So I didn't have that either. So I, I was lost traditionally, mentally, everything. So what did you finally do? How did you end up at La Plazita? He was here for like a couple of months and then got in a big fight and then he had, to, he had to leave. And then my mom and him were going through divorce and I started getting into some trouble. So I ended up at La Plazita, I had to do community service. And so, oh, the court sentenced you to community service. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Because I know um, they have a lot of uh, traditional practices and rituals. Did that help fill the void? Yeah, it did because, well, I went to a school called Native American Community Academy, and Albino's son worked there, and he was a Lakota language teacher. Oh, Albino is the director of La Plazita, yeah. co-director. Okay. So, so I was, I was yeah, I like, mean, Albino can be tough. Yeah. <laughs> was that good? Yeah, it was good because I kind of guess I needed someone to like to do that for me to kind of discipline me a little bit and tell me like, you know, you're messing up, you know, cut it out for like a lack of better words, I guess. <laughs> but so what are you doing now? Right now I'm the crew leader for the Barrio Youth Choir. Okay. The Barrio Youth Choir of La Plazita? Yeah, La Placita. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you want to do? Um, I want to go back to school okay. and eventually I want to um, get my degree in wildlife biology. Okay. And, you know, Jose, I didn't ask you when we first talked to you. You're in school now, right? I'm going to trade school at CNM, um, going for uh, tourism and hospitality, uh, so business. Um, afterwards, I would like to go uh, to New Mexico State and continue my education. Uh, but my goal is to start something like a homeboy industries. Oh, the group in Los Angeles? Yes. That uh, employs... Um, they employ former gang members, I think, yeah, and they, they employ, have like they employ, small businesses. They employ whoever, oh, okay. uh, whoever um, in the society is harder for them to get a job. But my goal of going to school, of uh, joining place like the Body Youth Corp, is to really understand, you know, like, all right, I did get a good role model, but what about the guys that didn't get a good role model? So you're already becoming a leader in your community. I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to turn to to Willie and Joseph. Um, you're a little older than our young men here. Mm -hmm. uh, you both went through some tough times in your youth, yeah, and um, uh, maybe had role models, maybe didn't. It's a lot of things I can say about my parents. You know, they was always there. I mean, it was like overprotected. But I grew up in a neighborhood or a city to where uh, you got the outside life to look at too. So we see little kids or we see people from the neighborhoods, they doing things, uh, experimenting things. And so 
also in your head, that's like, um, there's some cool kids or those a cool group to walk on with. They got new shoes on, we got old shoes, or they riding a bike and we don't have a bike, so we want to try to be like them. So at the same time, we go home and ask mom and dad, could we get this, these things? It like, uh, you, and we not knowing when we was growing up that it takes a lot of money back then to buy these things, and especially for five kids. So it was a lot, it was a lot. I could say that when I got grown and got older to where I like, I wish I should have listened to my parents. I, I wish I should have because the thing that I did to try to go the easy way around, it really didn't work. God didn't let it happen. He's like, dude, you're going to do, you're going to do what's meant for you. You so gonna, you think you had some bad role models, yeah. and you did some things to get yeah. those things that you wanted that but at landed the end you of the in day, prison. <laughs> yeah, at the end of the day, yeah. you realize who's your real role models. That's what I seen. And I was like, dude, when I went to jail, my real role models were there. You know, they cared for me. Are you doing that for your community? I'm doing it for my, my kids, my community. I just come from a funeral, and the same neighborhood where kids or youngsters looked up to me, they see, like, this dude for real. I used to... um chill with this dude. I used to look up to this dude and he's not doing what we doing no more. You know? And I talked to him or whatever and So whatever you're saying like, look, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not this doing is this who thing I am. No more. And Did they like, listen? And they and they like we know what he's he was about. We know he was a good dude. So they looking at it like if he can do it and not let nobody manipulate him, I can do it. And that's what they all did. And mm. I really liked his story because for him to be how old are you? Eighteen. Eighteen. He have, a, he have a long story to tell, and I'm like, this dude has seen a lot. So you have a chance to tell everybody and try to change, make a change too. We have to make a change for ourselves first before we can get out and help others. So that's, that's where it starts from. But I like his idea too because it's starting a program with helping people like gang members and people like coming out of prison or ex-cons. That's yeah. the same program we are in. You know, New Mexico did that for us. New Mexico made a change. Father Bit in Future made a change for us. And making us feel like we somebody because um, just say we feel comfortable of taking care of our family now. We, we don't have to worry about, oh, if our car going to get repoed or not paying the rent or our kids going to eat because they made us feel so uncomfortable and they f made us feel like it's, I, I see that, I see New Mexico, period, um, another family. Joseph, uh, you are also with Fathers Building Futures. You're getting back with your family, your community after incarceration. So. Are you, do you think of yourself as a role model? I guess in some ways I do, in some ways I don't. People tell me that I need to look at myself like that, but I, I guess I'm just modest and I don't give myself that credit. You know what I mean? Like we all make changes, we all make impact. We all have influence over somebody, which I understand. We had a conversation before where I said like, I, I, I just want to be a good example because there's people out there with better success stories than me. and. Mine is just an example of what you can accomplish after making wrong choices. Because I did have a good upbringing. My mom and dad have been there for me since birth. Like, you know, my dad, he's my stepdad, but he's my dad. Like, I love him. Like, he's my hero. He's my role model. He's my influence. He showed me how to be a good man, a good father, a good supporter, a provider. It's as I got older, I just, I just started making my own decisions, hmm. which led me to drug use. Uh, the drug use is what carried me into criminal activity as I got older. I didn't get incarcerated until I was about 27 years old. So what kind of personal decision did you have to make to change this and go on this path? Oh man, I just wanted to make my next 30 years count. I'm th when I was incarcerated, I was 30 years old. You know, I'm facing eight years in prison, like, I'm getting too old to be f fighting and stabbing and just l having to live through that whole like jungle environment of prison, you know, like because it's not easy for anybody. And if so you, mm -hmm. I just I just told myself if I got the opportunity, I'm going to give my son at the time he was the only one I had something to be proud of. Do you feel like that experience now gives you um, the authority to go to younger guys and say, you know, you're you're on a, the wrong path here. You got to listen to me. I don't know if it gives us the authority because change comes from within, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So it really depends on the individual. It can give us the influence, like it can motivate us to be the influence to them and try to like make that difference. I want to turn to Xavier working with the New Mexico Forum and Youth and Community. Um, so how do you approach working with young people 
and you are still very young yourself, <laughs> finding role models, maybe listening to older men who might have that kind of wisdom to share. So I think authenticity and being genuine is the best way to approach anybody and let them know really where you're coming from and what your goal is for interacting with them. If you want to help them, then let them know that, but don't do it in a way where, you, where we're going to have the answers. We're just going to provide opportunity and connect people to, to organizations or to role models or to anyone. So it's just being really authentic and clear and transparent about what, what we're trying to do. We've heard uh, some of the, the young men from La Plazita, like, I feel like, um, and you gentlemen, you, when you got connected to something bigger than yourself in some ways, or you met people who overcame challenges, that sparked something. Absolutely. Is that what you guys, I mean, is that an approach you take, getting youth involved in the community? Absolutely. They inspire one another. They find out things about how they connect to society and what they do to, to, to influence whether it be their family, whether it be their whole community, whether it be legislature, they find out that everyone here who's sitting here and everyone who's watching this or anyone who's, who's existing has the potential to impact everything around them. And, and we, we try to convey that to them about their true power and their true potential. Do you feel like you got that when you were growing up? I think because I was raised by my grandfather um, majority because I didn't have my father either. So, but my grandfather, you know, it's a different time he grew up in a time where, you know, you really, it was so hard to exist and to, like, carry on life for family that there, there, you, you didn't think about legislature. You didn't think that you had that time and that resource. But, but really we do, and, really, and our voice matters because his voice being a farmer or a rancher was what was sustaining the city life and, and bringing all that resource. So I, I think that he would have conveyed it if he could have, but he didn't know how. He just showed you how to survive. Mm -hmm. and, and, and survival is much more than just, you know, paying the bills and taking care of family. It's making sure that we're voicing our opinion and that we're using our voice. And that's what the forum has taught me is that, that I have a voice and that my voice is important and their voice is important. And it's important to listen and it's important to speak. Chris, teaching you how to survive. I mean, I'm hearing him saying that. So does that mean if we go beyond teaching how to survive, teaching you how to be a man? how to be in society. There are, in our education system, very few role models for young men of color. And I was sharing, and I think it's important to say that, we have very few teachers that are, are males of color. Um, I've heard from you know, the stories from students that it's a janitor that they connected with, or maybe one, one administrator, like a guidance counselor or an assistant principal. Um, but we have to think about that we are sending young people into, into education systems where eight hours a day, they don't see anybody that looks like them. And if you're not getting it at home, and if you're not getting it in your school, there are going to be other influences that pull you in. Um, and so I think that's one other important thing to, to, to comment on. We have to recognize that a big part of it is what we can do ourselves, right? We can, we can some of these young men have learned to garden. Some of these young men are learning how to, um, learn a trade so that they can have a profession. But our society and the system at play is about criminalizing, especially men of color. We have a graduation rate right in our city that's about 60%. But when we look at young men of color, black, native, Latino, even Asian Pacific Islander, we see significantly less young men of color graduating. And we can actually st start to see that in elementary school, right? We're talking about a, com a society where Black and Latino and Native young men, 16 to 24, have something like a 50% unemployment rate. But I also want to talk about something on a societal level, and that is what it, several people have talked about this. What does it mean to be a man? And how we literally need to take back what the men's box is, right? Where men don't, men don't share our emotions, we don't communicate. And the most important part, and I've heard it today, is that we stop and say that we value each other. Right? Mm -hmm. That everybody in this circle has value, has knowledge, has skills, has passion, has the ability to create change, not just for themselves, but I want to take it to the next level, our entire society. You and Javier as well, you've both also worked in this arena with um, young men of color who are, who are gay or transgendered or questioning, and that's got a whole other layer of, of challenges. I had an excellent family uh, role models in terms of males. My father, my older brother, my abuelo, I was taught from a very young age to work hard. To, I worked very, very young in uh, construction uh, with plants. 
And you know, when I was in the third grade, I remember my older brother helping me with math, and those were things that I concretely understand that were role modeling from my brother. My dad would always say, con ganas, do it con ganas. When you do stuff, you do it the best you can. If you're going to be a ditch digger or if you're going to be a professor, you just be the best ditch digger or professor you can be. And then at the same time, you know, I grew up in a Hispanic Latino family where being a man meant, you know, you're tough. You don't, you don't do certain things. You don't act like a girl. And I thought that was like very, it was an internal struggle for me because I was like, what is that? Why, why can't I act like a girl? Why is that a bad thing? If I want to dance to Cindy Lauper, what's the big deal? <laughs> um, and these were the men that I looked up to. That must so, have been really confusing. It was very confusing. So how did you find a role model that would help you through kind of that well, process? Well, I repressed my own, I'm also queer, I repressed that and didn't come out until I was almost 30. Um, and then when I did come out, it was with my community here. I mean, the family aspect that everybody's touched on was also super important. And, and we're talking about young queer men of color. The same exact story, historias that all these gentlemen have shared, same. Young men of color uh, who are queer are incarcerated. They can't get jobs. And then if you take it into an arena of trans people of color, it's, it's tenfold because they're not obeying these structural or institutional rules that we're all supposed to obey. I never had teachers, like if I had professors like these guys, I would have wanted to hear their voices. That's, they, they sound like my dad, they sound my, like my abuelo. My brother's been incarcerated many times uh, and it's like, that's my familia. In school, I never had that. I always thought like, why do I want to read these stories? This is not me, I don't, in a lot of American literature, I, I never saw myself and it wasn't until I got into college and I had mostly female professors that were Puerto Rican or other ethnicities that I was like, wow, I see myself in that. And that took a long time. I mean, I didn't have that in school. So it's, that's one reason that role models are so important because they're showing people who look like you doing things that maybe you didn't know you could do and giving you that kind of idea to strive for. Um, we're gonna take a break and then we'll add in our leadership and continue this conversation. I appreciate it, just hang tight. <laughs>